grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Sometimes we're not quite sure exactly what Jesus is up to. We know from the perplexed attitude that the crowds and even his own disciples had that a lot of times his teachings were a mystery to them. Now, because we live on the other side of Easter morning, and because the church has had 2,000 years to reflect on what Jesus' teachings mean, maybe to us they've become a little bit too familiar. We know the end of the story already. The creed that we just confessed gives us a very nice bottom line kind of confession of who Jesus is and what he's come to do. And it very neatly summarizes everything that we need to know. We know where Jesus was going all the time. We know that he was headed to Jerusalem to fulfill his ultimate mission, to seek and to save that which was lost by dying on the cross for the sins of all the world. But, you know, for a guy with one very simple mission to fulfill, he certainly talks a lot. He likes to take the long way around his point, and that, of course, always makes preachers feel better about themselves. But unraveling that mysterious thread that runs through all of the teachings of Jesus is the preacher's task. And not only the preacher's task, but all of us who gather to hear the word of God when it's read and proclaimed and taught, everybody who's become captivated by the story of Jesus is faced with that task every Sunday. And it can be a challenge and also a joy to find Jesus' cross wherever he's hidden in it in the text that we consider today, and today being the parable of the wedding feast. Now on the surface, the parable today is conventional enough. It's a lesson in saving face. So when you're invited to a party, don't ever take the best seat in the house unless it's offered to you. If you go to a wedding reception, please, don't take the best man's seat unless, of course, you're the best man. That would be kind of embarrassing if you took what didn't belong to you. We've all had those kind of embarrassing moments that we really wish that we could forget, that even when you think about them years later, um, you still get kind of red in the face when you think about what a fool you made of yourself. And when you have those moments, they're truly cringeworthy. Or in the parlance of today's youth, which I learned this week from the kids at Trinity, those moments are cringy. You really wish that you could forget them. So, Jesus says, don't ever go to a wedding feast and take the place of honor. Because the man of the hour might come to you and say, why don't you give your seat to this guy? Because he's actually a member of the in crowd, and you're not, buddy. So Jesus says, when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at table with you. So save face. Learn humility. That's what Jesus seems to be saying. He concludes his parable with this. Everyone who humbles himself, or rather everyone who exalts himself, will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. It's as a very great theologian once said, I believe his name was Tim McGraw, always stay humble and kind. And that's a very conventional piece of wisdom. And it's something that Jesus, as a faithful Jew, would have known from the book of Proverbs, which we hear as our Old Testament lesson today. Do not put yourself forward in the king's presence or stand in the place of the great, for it is better to be told, come up here, than to be put lower in the presence of a noble. Save face, stay humble, so you won't ever have to be humbled. We certainly lack humility, not thinking Too highly of yourself is a virtue that uh, we could all practice a whole lot better. We also hear about humility from 
St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians today. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility. I uh, had a classmate in college once who, with what I'm sure were the best of intentions, he decided he was going to start a blog called Staying Humble. And uh, he wanted to walk in humility, and he didn't mind sharing with the rest of the world just how well he was doing at that. Of course, I'm more humble than he is, but that's beside the point. But we know that seriously, the true humility is a struggle for all of us. But is that really what Jesus was trying to get across to the Pharisees? Now, this is where we uncover the mystery of Jesus' parable. He interprets the parable for us, so let's hear again his explanation. Everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. So notice what Jesus doesn't say. He doesn't actually say, keep yourself humble so you won't ever be humbled. That would be a nice rule of thumb for everyday living, but Jesus is more interested in eternal living. Jesus says that the ones who are self-exalted will be humbled. Those who occupy positions of power and privilege, like the Pharisees with whom he was dining that day, those high and mighty people who think that they can stand in judgment over other people, including Jesus, who dares to break the Sabbath law by healing somebody, it's the high and mighty people like that who will be brought down. The Pharisees thought that they knew the law better than Jesus, even though Jesus was the one who'd actually instituted the Sabbath in the beginning. He's the one who's the Lord of the Sabbath. He's the only one in the room that actually fulfills the law that day, which calls us and commands us to love our neighbor. He heals the man with dropsy out of love, and he does what his distinguished hosts did not do. And so it's a very good thing that we faithful churchgoers are not hypocrites like those Pharisees, right? That we never put on a facade to impress other people. We never presume to judge people who we just can't believe have showed up to church today to sing God's praises with us. We never lie and wait for other people, just waiting to see what, where those kinds of people will mess up. And we never hold a grudge against anybody else because we know that we've been forgiven so much. We would always rush to take the lowest place. If only that was true. The truth is that we don't know what it means to take the lowest place because the lowest place has already been taken. Jesus had the most exalted place before all worlds at the right hand of God the Father. He had everything in subjection under him, all creation, all angels and archangels, all powers and authorities, and he was equal with God. And yet he made himself nothing by taking the form of a slave. He was born in the likeness of our sinful flesh. He put himself in the lowest place, at the dirty feet of his own disciples, which he washed. And then he allowed himself to be beaten and slandered and spit upon by the Pharisees, by the same religious leaders who put on such a good front for the rest of the world. And then he permitted them to collude with Pilate, who then tortured him to death in the most shameful way possible, the death of a criminal's cross. And he bore your shame and your hypocrisy and all your sin and his pure and innocent body. He took the place, the lowest place, that you deserve with the criminals and the slaves and the sinners. And he found that place on the wood of his own cross. And Jesus did all of this so that he might be to you the master of the wedding feast, that he might say to you, friend, move up higher. Jesus humbled himself 
so that as he rose from the dead and ascended to his Father's right hand, he could be exalted. Jesus is the one who humbled himself so that we who've been humbled by our sins and by our shame, by our mortality, might share in his glory. And for now, that glory looks awfully humble as we kneel here in his presence at his feast today. Our glory still looks like his cross. But even here, we are his friends. And to his friends, he gives peace, surpassing all understanding, that guards our hearts and minds in him. Amen. We stand for